So here we are, Book of Colossians. This is lesson number 11 in that series. And if you're following along in your Bibles, we'll be in Colossians chapter three. So this is the next to last lesson in our, in our series on the book of uh, Colossians. So far we have learned that Paul wrote this letter in response to the efforts of false teachers, calls them Judaizers, uh, their effort to minimize the place of Christ and his teachings and then substitute their own teachings uh, in his place. So that's the, that's the problem he's dealing with as he writes this epistle. Now the result of this was that the Colossians were being lured away from their peace and security in Jesus and they were being tempted to base their salvation on you know, the following of food laws or uh, circumcision and various teachings on the position and the power of angels, for example. So Paul's answer to this is to demonstrate that Jesus Christ and His teachings are the basis upon which they are saved and they continue to be saved and upon which they should base their lives. So he goes on to explain what their lives should be like if they base their lives on the teachings of Christ rather than on the empty teachings of the Judaizers. So this has been the subject of our last couple of lessons. You know, the, the standard or the ethic that pertains to Christian living. And this standard, Paul says, has several features. You know, what is the standard of living for Christians? When we talk about that, you know, we're not talking about the amount of money you, you make or the, the place you live, but rather your conduct and your attitude. So, so far he's uh, mentioned uh, several things. He says, as far as the standard of Christian living is concerned, it consists of a holiness, and he emphasizes sexual purity as part of that holy living standard. Uh, it uh, also has a, a loving nature, speaking the truth uh, to one another. Uh, a thankful heart that is seen in praise and, and sincere worship. An ordered family, where each in the family has a particular God-given role uh, to fulfill. So this week we're going to continue describing the standard of living that flows from Jesus' teachings by adding the final feature that Paul describes in his letter, and that is an ordered society, an ordered society. Now Paul mentioned that Christians are to have an ordered family, and he continues this thought to include the natural extension of an ordered family, and that is an ordered society. You know, people today complain, oh, society is falling apart, we don't, you know, social norms are falling apart. Well, and they try to fix it socially, right? Corporately, they try to fix society. But we know that you know, an ordered society flows from an ordered family. It's the family that needs to be reordered. It's the family that needs the help because an ordered family will produce an ordered society. So that's what he talks about in Colossians. Now he doesn't go into great detail about this, about ordered society. He simply comments on the role and the attitude of the two main positions of society in that day, and that was slaves and masters. Now in the Roman Empire of the day, you really had only two classes. You had slave or free, that was it. Then you had different degrees of free, but it was, that's, that was the dividing line. You're a slave or you're free. Uh, these were uh, divisions with, as I said, there were divisions within these. You had different order of slaves even. Some who were stewards, had a higher responsibility, others who were just common slaves. So Paul, in the letter, he doesn't condone slavery. He merely provides the teaching necessary for Christians to live properly and orderly before God, whatever class you found yourself in. Sometimes the knock on Paul by some is that, well, he didn't, you know, he didn't denounce slavery. Well, that's not what he was trying to do. Okay. So he talks to slaves first, chapter 3, 22 to 25, and he tells them several things that will guide their Christian lives. So let's read together. He says, slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. 
for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. So what does he say to the slaves? Number one, obey sincerely. You know, not just lip service to the master, but true obedience from the heart, knowing that the Lord, he sees your heart. Maybe the master doesn't see it, but the Lord sees it. He knows what sincere service is. Secondly, he encourages them to work enthusiastically. No grumbling, no slacking. Do your work cheerfully and with enthusiasm as if you are working for God, for the Lord, and not for man, the master. Paul reminds slaves that God will judge and will reward their work. Their attitude and work should not be based on their master's character or the reward they may receive. It should be done to please God who will issue the final reward, which is eternal life. By the way, that's the inheritance. When he talks about the inheritance, another word for the eternal life that Christians look forward to as their reward. A wonderful promise to one who was destined to a lifetime of slavery here on earth. And then thirdly, he says, you will be judged. They shouldn't hide their disobedience and laziness behind the excuse of slavery. God is impartial, he says, and will judge everyone based on their obedience to Him, not based on their station in life, whether you're slave or free, everybody gets judged. And then he talks to the masters, and he says to them, masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Again, Paul does not give all the instructions for a master's life, only that which will set the tone for a proper relationship with their slaves, because that's what he's talking about, and a proper relationship with their slaves in the eyes of God. As masters, they do have a responsibility, and their responsibility is to be just, to see to the needs of the ones that they are over and fair, not to take advantage of those in their charge. You know, it'd be easy to treat them as less than human because the slaves were seen as property. But God reminds them of their stewardship in caring for their slaves. He also warns them that they, they too are slaves of the master and should pattern their attitude after the attitude that Jesus, their master, has for them. The implication, of course, is that they too will be judged the slaves will be judged, the masters will be judged, and they'll be judged by God's criteria, not their criteria. Now, you know, one question always arises, you know, how come Paul is not denouncing slavery? You know, it's obviously it's, it's wrong. He doesn't dis denounce slavery as evil and try to begin a revolution. He merely guides the two classes of people in how to live orderly lives before God in the positions that they occupy. Paul, uh, the apostle, was not sent, not sent to earth, but wasn't chosen to be a revolutionary or a political activist. He was chosen to preach the gospel. That was his task. Now we know that Paul encouraged those who could obtain their freedom to do so in 1 Corinthians 7.21 but he did not encourage rebellion. To encourage rebellion would have created chaos in the church and in society, not order. So here he's talking about how do we live in an ordered way in the society that we now live in, the way it is. So slavery, as we know, was eventually defeated, wasn't it? as Christianity overtook the various social systems of the Roman Empire. It was a long and slow and painful you know, process. But you know, planting the church, planting the seeds of Christianity, the ideology of Christianity eventually permeating the Roman Empire, eventually slavery was done away with. And I might add, it is Christian thinkers and activists who you know, fought against slavery in the modern times, I say in the modern times, I mean you know, the 17th, 18th century. Uh, people who, who, who denounced slavery, many of them were uh, uh, sincere and devout uh, Christians. So Paul adds one more feature to the Christian lifestyle and that's an ordered society, as seen in the relationship between free and slave. Today, as seen in the relationship between employer and employee, right? Manager and worker, 
we're not slaves, but we are under, aren't we? We are under our bosses, our supervisors, the, the guy who owns the company, the person who manages our division, the teacher, the dean. Everybody's under everybody, somewhere along the line. So Christians strive to maintain order in their working relationships, whatever position they hold, knowing that they serve the Lord and will ultimately be judged by Him, not man. Man's not going to judge us. God's going to judge. It's always amazing to me how people are so much more afraid of the judgment that other people will make of them than the judgment that God's going to make. That's the one I'm afraid of. So uh, as we move to uh, chapter four, the idea is that if they accept Christ and His teachings as the standard, then their lives will reflect the fact that they live by this standard, the standard that I've just uh, reviewed with you in all areas. Their lives, as Paul has shown, will be holy and loving and thankful and will demonstrate ordered living, not only in the home, but an attempt at ordered living in society. So in the next verse, chapter 4, 2, verse 2, Paul is going to move seamlessly into the final part of his letter, which will include several words of encouragement and the commendation of various workers. So let's work our way through that. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the, world, uh, for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. So he encourages them to you know, continue giving thanks for their many blessings, but also pray for him. He's in prison, remember? Various individuals seek to destroy his work. There's a lot to do still. He still faces a trial. So he asks them to be devoted to prayer on his behalf and the others who work with him, so that he'll be able to preach to others the good news who haven't heard it yet, you know, God is the one who provides opportunity for Paul and he wants his ministry to continue. Also that he have the wisdom to defend himself at the imperial court in Rome as he awaited this trial in prison. So much of his future ministry rested on the outcome of his appearance at court. Now we know he was released for a while, for about two years, as I said in the introduction lesson. And he spent the time after his release revisiting and strengthening the churches that he had established in Crete, in Iconium, Ephesus, Corinth, so on and so forth. Read about that in Titus chapter 1 verse 5. But at the writing of this letter, he was unsure of the future and the outcome of the trial, so he asks them to pray for him. Verse 5 and 6, we go on, he says, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity, let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So in the, in the context of him having to deal with pagans at court and in prison, he turns the prayer request for himself around to them by encouraging them to be careful how they communicate with non-Christians. You know, he was in prison, he's fighting for his life, and yet despite this, he had been able to spread the gospel throughout the prison in Rome. We don't read about that here, but we read about that in, uh, in uh, I think Philemon chapter uh, one, or Philippians chapter one. He tells them that by their good conduct, and he's explained in the previous chapter what that good conduct should be like, right? Holy lives, loving, so on and so forth. By their good conduct and careful speech, not foolish, not coarse, and a speech full of grace, they too must take full advantage of every opportunity to respond to the outsiders concerning the faith. You know, the point is this, look, I'm in jail, I'm fighting for my life, and I'm managing to convert people, I'm managing to influence people for Christ. You know, it's not just about me. So he says, you, know, you people do the same. I know you're busy, I know you got stuff, you got to take care of your business, you know, sure, I know that. But as you're doing those things, surely you have an opportunity with your holy life and your ordered life and your gracious speech and so on and so forth. You have an opportunity to impact others for the faith. Another historical note or reason here, him being in prison 
might have driven them underground. Uh-oh, Paul's in prison, we better watch our back. But he tells them that with good conduct and careful and graceful speech, they can reach others for Christ. They can witness their faith. They don't have to hide. They don't have to be afraid. Verse seven to nine, now he begins the greetings and commendations to the various individuals. He says, as to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here. So a whole you know, number of people Tychicus. Tychicus, he was one of Paul's personal representatives and the one who carried this letter to Colossae, to the church at Colossae, and also another letter to um, uh, the uh, Ephesian church. He was also considered as one to relieve Titus in Crete and Timothy in Ephesus. Read about that in Titus and in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, in this passage, Paul refers to him as beloved and faithful and able to inform them accurately of his situation. So he was a trusted and useful minister in the early church. Don't hear a lot about him, but we get a bit of a background here. Then he talks about Onesimus. Onesimus was the runaway slave from Colossae who Paul converted in prison. He was returning home, accompanying Tychicus and bringing a letter to his former master Philemon. So he's mentioned here. Um, in verse 10 and 11, Paul mentions uh, Aristarchus. He says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. So he mentions Aristarchus. He was an early companion of Paul, and we see him first as one uh, with the apostles in Ephesus during the attack by the mob. If you remember that in Acts chapter 19. He also accompanied Paul to Jerusalem with the collection for the saints, Acts 24. Uh, and later we see him again with Paul as he sailed under guard for Rome, Acts 27 too. It seems that he rejoined Paul as a voluntary prisoner in order to minister to his needs. Colossians 4.10, imagine that, talk about loyalty. I mean, he, he volunteers to be you know, in prison with Paul so that he can, that he can help him. Um, Paul also mentions John Mark, Familiar character, his mother's home was used by the apostles in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Mary. He was brought to Antioch by his cousin Barnabas and left on the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas as their helper, Acts 13.5. Uh, we know that he refused, we don't know why, he refused for some reason to go into the mainland and turned around you know, before they had completed their missionary journey, turned around and went back to Jerusalem, Acts 13, 13. Of course, later on, this caused a dispute between Barnabas and Paul when Barnabas wanted to bring him on another missionary journey. And Paul said, no, 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 no. He quit on us the first time. We're not taking him the second time. And so there was a dispute between Paul and Barnabas. And you know, they split up, each going their own way. Barnabas took Mark under his wing went to work in a separate place in Cyprus, while Paul went on to work in Asia Minor in Greece. We see by this mention of him here in the Colossian letter that Mark was reunited with Paul in the work and highly regarded by him. So after Paul's death, we also see further mention of Mark by Peter in 1 Peter 5.13, and now he is Peter's helper. And a lot of scholars feel that the gospel of Mark is actually Peter's recounting of his own experience uh, written out by his secretary, uh, Mark. Then there's the mention of justice. Not much is known about him other than this mention of him right here in this particular letter. Now, Paul has spent much of this epistle refuting false Jewish teachers among them, but quickly mentions three fellow Christian Jews who are faithful and who are beloved. It's not that all the Jews who became Christians were false teachers. You know, he doesn't want to give that impression. 
So he mentions several Christian Jews to show that there are many brethren among the Jews who are faithful and who are trustworthy. So he mentions um, Epaphras in chapter 4, 12 and 13. He says, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God, for I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. So Epaphras, a friend and co-worker of Paul, a lot of scholars believe he was a different person than Epaphroditus mentioned in 2 Corinthians 8.23. 8, I'm not going to kind of get into that debate, but some people think that's the same person. One is just like a nickname, you know, Michael, Mike, you know, well, Epaphras, Epaphroditus. You know. Others think they were two different people. We do know that Epaphras worked as an evangelist and he helped in the establishment of the churches in Colossae and Hierapolis and Laodicea. Paul says he's from Colossae and was a man who prayed fervently for them. And Paul attests to the fact that uh, Epaphras was truly concerned. He agonized, the word is agonized. He agonized over their faith and he wanted them to be fully assured that God wanted them to be saved and secure in Christ. This was God's will. So he was a Jewish Christian and one who was solid in the faith and who was uh, 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 love, he loved his, his brethren, his Gentile Christian uh, brethren. And then he mentions, <coughs> excuse me, he mentions Luke Verse 14, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. Again, Paul only mentions Luke in passing, not because he's unimportant, but rather that he is finishing his letter and his readers, they know Luke. You know, he doesn't have to give all of Luke's background. Everybody knows Luke. A companion and fellow traveler with Paul, of course, we know the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Uh, interestingly, the only place where he's referred to as a physician is here in Colossae. And then he mentions Demas. Interesting about Demas, three references to Demas. Two of them say he is a fellow worker and sends greetings. And then the final one in 2 Timothy 4 verse 10, which reveals that he finally abandoned Paul and the work to return to a worldly lifestyle. So he was Paul's secretary at the time and he was the scribe before his fall. So here's, a, here's an individual who followed Paul. He heard the teachings of Paul. He perhaps even saw some of the miracles that Paul performed. He was intimately acquainted with that ministry. And yet the lure of the world kind of drew him back. Just goes to show you, you know, that uh, uh, we can easily fall. We shouldn't say we stand. We can easily fall. And then the final greetings and instructions that come now in rapid succession. He says in chapter uh, 415, he says, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. So verse 15, greetings to the church in Laodicea and a smaller group meeting in the home of an individual. Verse 16, Paul mentions another letter, this one to the Laodiceans, which he has written and sent, but this letter has not been found, it's lost. But in the letter, apparently he instructs them to exchange letters, that's how it worked. You know, the letters circulated there at the beginning before they were all collected into one volume. And then verse 17, the only other reference to Archippus is in the letter to Philemon, and he was probably Philemon's son. So Epaphras had left the church in Colossae, where Archippus and Philemon were, in order to go to Rome to minister to Paul. And it seems that Epaphras had left his ministry there in the hands of Archippus. Paul exhorts him, like he does Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, to not neglect that ministry, but to work at it and be diligent. In the end, the ministry had really been given to him by the Lord, not just by Epaphras or by Paul. So yeah, one thing about this letter it demonstrates that everybody needs encouragement, even the preachers. Even the preachers 
need to be encouraged to do their best and to keep on doing their work and not be discouraged and so on and so forth. So you know when I'm maybe you know, preaching to the choir here, but you know, when you, when you uh, hear a class or you know, a sermon, something like that, Marty's preaching something that uh, touches you, that really uh, opens your eyes to something, it's okay to, to wait a moment and to go see him and say, hey, that was good, thank you, that, that, that was important for me. You know? Uh, the, these type of things are very, very uh, encouraging and, and, uh, and motivating. Because you know, let's face it, you know, just like a lot of, in a lot of the helping professions, doctors, nurses, policemen, t teachers, social workers, you know, in a lot of the helping professions, the thing you see all the time is trouble. Is trouble. You know, people are in trouble, they're sick, they're getting a divorce, they're, they're on drugs. You, know, you see trouble, well ministers are like that. They see trouble a lot more. Nobody calls me up and said, hey, you know, I just got a raise and you know, we found a house that we, we saved $40,000 on that house. I just wanted to share that with you. No, nobody does that. <laughs> no, the call that you get is, look, we're on our way to the lawyers to sign, you know, to put in a divorce decree, but we thought we'd stop by and get some counseling before we go there. <laughs> yeah, that's what you get a lot of. So anyways, the thing that kind of, um, uh, is encouraging is to see this is nothing new. You know, 2,000 years ago, these young preachers, you know, they needed to be encouraged to keep on going and, and do the best that they could. All right, verse 18, he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment, grace be with you. So Paul signs with his own hand the letter dictated to Demas as proof of authenticity because at the time, remember, there were a lot of things floating around that were not authentic, and as a way of sending his own, personal, his own personal greeting. And he urges them to remember his imprisonment and what it stands for and why he's there. And he's there for what? For the glory of God, for the gospel of Christ. Remember that, he says. I'm not just here on vacation. He finishes with a blessing that God's grace or favor be upon or with them. And so with this uh, blessing, uh, Paul ends the letter which puts forth Christ and his teaching as the primary or preeminent basis upon which knowledge of the true God is revealed and faith for salvation is based and direction for Christian living is established. You know, whenever someone tells me, you know, what, what book should I study? What, what epistle should I read? What would be good for me you know, to build my faith? And I always suggest the book of Colossians simply because it, it, it places Christ you know, as uppermost in the faith. Uh, it places Christ as the basis for our faith and the growing of our faith. And it gives us direction and encouragement um, in our faith and strengthens our faith. Especially in this day and age when there's so many philosophies and lifestyle things and so on and so forth going around you know, telling us how we should act and how we should be. Uh, th that minimizes the power of the gospel and the ability of the word to direct us and, and truly help us grow in, in grace and knowledge, in peace, in strength and in confidence. So Colossians is a great book. I, I, there's one more, uh, there's, uh, yeah, one more lesson in this uh, that I want to do and I don't want to start it today because we don't have enough time. We've got about eight minutes left. There's not enough time to do that. So I'm going to save that for next week, which is a summary, make some important points hopefully some take home lessons and ideas. So we're going to stop right here. I'm going to continue this next week.